So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, hide a pen who I've never met and make a great recovery. Um, so what I wanted to do was to bring you what may, oh, then again, may not, be the first or at least one of the earlier uses of the word depth, which I want to associate with Gauss, uh, who introduced it as a value judgment um, and would prove to be a very popular value judgment, at least among German mathematicians of the 19th century. So I can't say this is absolutely the first time the words uh, ever used, but it had a currency. Okay? Um, and I say here, almost every major mathematician, Jamie reminded me that geometers, the Pluckers and Hesses and Klebschers of the world didn't do this. But it's astonishing how many German mathematicians from the 19th century you can name felt that they should contribute in some way to algebraic number theory, and Riemann's only contribution, the famous one, uh, is perhaps more an analytic number theory. So this is Gauss. This is how he gets started um, and how the, he introduces the term. He's discovered for himself that minus 1 is a quadratic residue of all primes of the form 4n plus 1 and not of the form 4n minus 1. And this made him suspect a connection, he says, with other even more profound results. So that's, that's him getting started on this. It's a special case of the theorem of quadratic reciprocity, which he called the golden theorem and regarded as fundamental. So what's the Latin term that he used? Profundus? Uh, yes. And he gives two proofs in Disquisitiones of 1801. Uh, he publishes four more over the years. He leaves two more unpublished to death. So there's a total of eight proofs of this theorem. Uh, and that has a lot to do with what we've been talking about already, the, the connections uh, between different bits of mathematics that bear on the same result and in some way contribute to a sense you have of its uh, importance. So we're in the phenomenon of multiple proofs, and Dawson has written a book on multiple proofs. Uh, he lists uh, eight ways in which uh, people might want to find more than one proof of a theorem. After all, you've proved it. Somebody's proved it. Uh, these struck me as the more relevant, and I think Gauss is onto something like three, but a bit different. Simpler, more perspicuous reasoning might be a reason for giving a new proof. To display the power of different methodologies, to discover a new route, and then methodological purity. You might think that some proofs would just didn't get to the essence of the subject because they dragged in extraneous matters. So these would be pernicious connections to other fields rather than propitious ones. Okay. Gauss is explicit. He argues that you find hidden connections between concepts and bring out aspects that were hidden but implied in other proofs. And I'm going to insist on hidden as part of uh, the concept of depth that Gauss is pushing here. And I noticed John, John's arguments, for example, the proofs lay way down beneath lots of other stuff that had to be excavated out of the way. Uh, and this is Yuri Manin, quoted in Lemmermeyer's book. When I was young, I was extremely interested in the fact that Gauss found seven or eight proofs of the quadratic reciprocity law. What bothered me was why he needed seven or eight proofs. Every time I gained some more understanding of number theory, I better understood Gauss's mind. Of course, he was not looking for more convincing arguments. One proof is sufficiently convincing. The point is that proving is the way we are discovering new territories, new features of the mathematical landscape. So we're doing new stuff here. And this, uh, I was interested when Jamie was talking about the active versus the passive here. We have a tendency to look at a theorem which is well known, whose proof we may have been taught, and go, oh, that's beautiful, that's deep, that's wonderful. It's not so clear to me that a mathematician engaged in doing original research is guided by these kind of thoughts. Okay? So we can look and see, as this course proceeds, how many people thought that they were trying to do something uh, deep. Gauss, as I say, gives two proofs. The first is a bullet a gate proof. It splits the problem into eight cases and does it. Uh, this uh, somewhat resembles Legendre's early attempt. Um, the crucial difference is that Gauss's proof is valid. Uh, and Legendre's is not, and he winds up in a nasty, vicious circle. He actually assumes the theorem on um, the existence of uh, primes in arithmetic progressions. Gauss, his second proof, the one I want to talk about, is interesting because it brings in what he regards as deep. So this is a table, and I'm going to talk you through this table. Okay? So right now, I imagine <coughs> it's pretty much seriously incomprehensible. I want you to look, first of all, at the columns on the right, starting with 1, 0, 1, 6, 1, and winding up at 6, minus 1, 27. And I'll explain what that bit is, and then I'll show you the table again, and we'll deal with the bits on the left. 
So the ABC, the 10161, for example, stands in Gauss's notation for a quadratic form AX squared plus 2BXY plus CY squared. He has a notion of equivalent, which he kind of gets from Lagrange with a crucial spin on it. Uh, the obtainable one from another by uh, linear transformations of determinant, well, Gauss insists on plus one, and we'll come back to that. Lagrange didn't insist on plus or minus one. What's wrong with just flipping x and y around? How can that be a problem when you're writing quadratic forms? Uh, these transformations will preserve what I'll call the discriminant, b squared minus ac. And uh, if you want to insist on the theorems being correct, then I require that a, b, and c have no common divisor and other than one, and a, 2, b, and c have no common divisor other than one. That's the jargon term properly primitive here down at the bottom. Um, Lagrange had already shown with his definition of equivalence, Gauss follows with his, that there's a very simple test, a very simple way of classifying uh, your canonical forms of a given discriminant. Um, and in the case where the discriminant is minus 161, the table we have here, there are in fact 16 of these. It's to find the uh, best representative in the equivalence class. Um, the, the Lagrange essentially had done that. Another thing you may have noticed about the table, which had to do with discriminant, minus 161 is that 161 factors are 7 times 23. Uh, Gauss then discovered what he called fixed relationships that exist um, in this theory. I'll indicate briefly what that is later. And they only exist for the factors of the uh, discriminant. Um, this is character theory, these, and it's the origin of the term characters in group representations. What's novel about Gauss at this point is he insists on a de determinant being plus one for those transformations, okay? And then, as you could probably guess, we say a quadratic form ABC represents an integer M if there are integers X and Y, such as AX squared plus 2BXY plus CY squared is equal to M, okay? So back to the table. Um, I've now indicated what the things are on the right. There are 16 of them. These are the 16 inequivalent quadratic forms of discriminant minus 161. And we have their best representative of each equivalence class exhibited in the boxes. So one of them is the quadratic form x squared plus 161 y squared and all the way down to the others. So that's the 16 things. There are 16 things here. And they're arranged in four lots of four. And that has to do with the numbers you see uh, in the three columns on the left. So for example, that entry that said 1, 4 said that every odd number in that row, there'd be four inequivalent collections of quadratic forms there, every odd number in that row is represented by a form, that, it, and the numbers that come out are congruent to 1 mod 4. That's what 1, 4 is. 3, 4 says congruent to 3 mod 4, or minus 1 mod 4. R7, let me just go back. When you see an R7 there, it says that the output of quadratic forms in that row are going to be residues modulo 7. They're going to be congruent to a square modulo 7. And an N says they're not going to be congruent. Um, so what you have is the quadratic forms on the right, classified in the Gauss or Lagrange style. I will insist on that determinant. And on the three columns on the left, you have some statements about the output okay, um, of the possible forms. And you could view it as a question. Someone comes to you and says, does your quadratic form represent 1,115,107? And I should say I'm dealing here just with the odd numbers that are being represented. Then you've got some tests to run, okay? You can ask, is this number you asked me, this 1 million and something, congruent to 1 mod 4? Is it congruent to a square mod 7? Is it congruent to a square mod 23? And if it is, it's going to be, if it's outputted at all, it'll be outputted by one of those quadratic forms in the top row, because you've got a bunch of yeses to your questions. Okay. So we have questions about 7. We have questions about 23. And these are the factors of 161. This is what Gauss means by a fixed relationship. If you ask for your quadratic form, so as you know it's represented a particular number by brute force, and that number checks out as uh, being congruent to 1 mod 4, congruent to a square mod 7, congruent to a square mod 23, then all the other odd numbers of that form are going to, be, are going to do that with respect to 7 and with respect to 23, but not, for example, with respect to 19. 
So this is the theorem. Now, what's really striking, or struck Gauss particularly, is that if you think of this question, what does the output do? I've got three questions to ask, right? Congruent to 1 mod 4, congruent to a square mod 7, congruent to a square mod 23. There are eight possible outputs, right? Two answers, yes or no, for the 1, 4. Two answers to is it a square mod 7. Two answers to is it a square mod 23, right? I hesitate to say C, P, T, but you had two values for C, two values for P, two values for T, and you only get one lot of output. You only get half the possible outputs here that you might expect, right? They're either all yeses or only one yes. OK? So half of them don't occur. Half of the possible outputs do not occur. OK? The outputs, the answers to these questions, Gauss called the characters. The collection of them he calls the complete character. The inequivalent forms with the same complete character, the ones I lined up on any particular row, or Gauss did, because I've taken it from the Discusitiones, belong to the same genus. Uh, this genus uh, on the top row contains the simplest quadratic form you could think of with discriminant minus 161, which is the principal form, and that row contains the forms in the principal genus. Um, and so you've got a nice genus story as well as a story about quadratic forms. Now this story, now you start looking for a proof of this, right? So far, and I'll come back to this point in a few minutes, so far, uh, this is number crunching. This is a serious number crunching. And Gauss loved this kind of thing. And you could imagine, it's very easy to write a program now to do this. You could imagine setting off, researching this stuff, and just, let's look at lots of examples. Let's see what we get. Let's see if anything turns up. Good you know, practice for a research mathematician. I got this advice from, from David Eisenberg. You pick an interesting topic, you work out lots of examples, and you get lucky. Okay, It's the last bit that's tricky. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Gauss wants to explain why only half the possible outputs occur. You could have easily done the number crunching, but you want to explain it. And for this, he has a horrendous theory called composition of forms. It goes back to the earlier ideas of Lagrange and uh, indeed Euler, uh, which says if you have a quadratic form that represents a number and that number factors, then there are other quadratic forms of the same discriminant which represent the factors of the number you began with. Composition runs that uh, the other way around. It says if you've got a quadratic form, uh, a1, b1, c1, and it represents a number, let's say m1, and you've got another one, a2, b2, c2, and it represents another uh, m2, and your two quadratic forms, you have the same discriminant. Let's take the simplest case. Then there's a third quadratic form of the same discriminant that represents the product, m1 times m2. If this form represents the product, why not think of the two forms as being the factors of a third quadratic form, which is their composite or product? And Gauss was the first person to give a general way of saying what the composite of two given forms of the same discriminant is. Here's the bad news. There is no simple formula for this. You have to make choices about the representatives of the forms before you can do the sums and compute the coefficients. It's not just a matter of solving equations. De Richelieu, very late in his career, gave a method of doing this, um, which uh, works uh, for, if you're allowed to, which works very well at the level of equivalence classes. It works very badly. Gauss's theory works in a very complicated and not always successful way if you're dealing with forms. If you're dealing with equivalence classes of forms, then de Richelieu gives a method for doing the composite finding the composite, but it involves a little bit of choosing. You still just don't enter the numbers. Uh, you have to choose the representatives of each equivalence class with a little bit of cunning. So uh, if you look in Buell's book, for example, uh, you get algorithms for doing this. Um, and other 19th century mathematicians gave algorithms. But that's because computers find it very easy to find a number which meets certain requirements. Okay. Um, it takes Gauss 30 pages to prove that uh, what you have if you have quadratic forms of a given discriminant is something we would call a commutative group. Since the concept of group is not available to Gauss, this is a pretty impressive achievement. Okay? He couldn't walk down the corridor to the algebraist and say, hey, I've got some composition going on, and get the answer. Oh, well, we've got some group theory. Maybe that would help you. Okay? That isn't going to be there. And as I've already said, the character theory grows out of all of this particular story. Um, 
Well, you might just say, okay, why bother? I mean, you know, Gauss has gone off and done this terribly complicated stuff. After all, he was only 20 at the time. People are terribly energetic in their early 20s. Why do we have to follow him? Um, it's because half the, these genera don't turn up. Half that combinations of yeses and noes don't turn up. And to prove that they don't turn up, he needs this theory of composition of forms. And he divides all the assignable characters, all the eight combinations you could have got, into two groups. And eventually what he proves is that back down at the bottom there, half of the possible assignable characters for a positive non-square discriminant can correspond to no properly primitive genus, and if the determinant is negative, to no properly primitive positive genus. So half of them can't, at least half of them can't occur. Then he has to go off and prove that the ones that haven't already been ruled out can, in fact, occur. And that's what he says here. It doesn't yet follow from this, the result in the previous slide, that half of all the assignable characters actually correspond to properly primitive positive genera. But later we shall establish the truth of this profound proposition concerning the most deeply hidden properties of numbers. And here's the word deep that we're talking about. This is what Gauss is going to call deep. Okay, um, And at this point, as a spin-off, he gets his second proof of quadratic reciprocity. He hasn't used it yet. Um, he's used squares modulo prime, but he hasn't used reciprocity. And he gets a proof of reciprocity out of this theory that rests on composition and doesn't rest on the bit that he's yet to show that half the assignable forms can occur. To do this, um, he then goes off and does another theory of films involving X's, Y's, and Z's. And de Richelieu, I was very glad John mentioned it, um, gives another proof that involves the class number formula. If you know the class number formula, you can show how many things do occur, and that's going to be the right amount. It's still regarded, as I understand it, although now I'm out of my debt, as a fundamental theorem uh, in number theory. All the books I could pull off my shelves said this fact is, is, is a pretty major fact. And it rests on showing that within this group of uh, equivalence classes of forms, the ones in the principal genus, the top row, are all squares. They're all multiples of some other form times itself. They're all actually squares. And once he's got this proof, he comments about it. These theorems are among the most beautiful in the theory of binary <coughs> forms because despite their extreme simplicity, that's to state, they are so profound that a rigorous demonstration requires the help of many other investigations. Right? So this is what's going to be crucial. The results are deep in the sense that they give you other things, they organize other things, but they are hidden. The rigorous demonstration requires the help of many other investigations. That's what makes them profound or deep in Gauss's sense of the word. Okay? And on another occasion, he says, it is characteristic of higher arithmetic, that's algebraic number theory to us, that many of its most beautiful theorems can be discovered by induction with the greatest of ease. You just do lots of numerical examples, and hey, you begin to get suspicious. But have proofs that lie anywhere but near at hand, and are often found only after many fruitless investigations with the aid of deep analysis and lucky combinations. Okay, you calculate lots of examples, and you get lucky. Okay, but somehow, you've really got to dig. You've got to work hard to get these things out. So this could just be the opinion of Gauss. But Gauss has this enormous influence on uh, German mathematicians down the 19th century. And I hadn't actually, I must say, just to digress, I hadn't realized in all the number of times I had said Gauss, a great mathematician, why? Until I read the number theory. Right? All the other stuff is terrific, but the number theory is really amazing. Um, so this is Kummer. Uh, I'm I went looking for the words deep. This is not a computer search, right? I can't, I can't say that I managed to churn every you know, printed book through some program. It would be quite interesting to do and just to see how many times the word turned up. But anyway, Kummer and his obituary of Dirichlet uh, spoke of Dirichlet as devoting his life to understanding the slew of deep mathematical ideas that the Disquisitiones Arithmetica contained and is the source of the story that Dirichlet never went anywhere without it. Kronecker called it the book of all books, which isn't the use of the word deep, but suggests to me that it's kind of underneath all of the other ones. And Edouard Lucas, at the end of the century, calls it an imperishable monument which unveils the vast expanse and stunning depth of the human mind. So what's difficult? Am I deep about this rather than just difficult? Okay. Well, what Gauss says, of course, is first of all, they're hidden. Right? These results are not, or the proofs, rather, are not immediately available to you. 
Everybody complains about the obscurity of these forms. Kummer uh, has speculations about what might be done. De Richelieu, Arndt, and Matthews offer algorithms for carrying it out. Finally, in 1879, in that edition of the 11th supplement, uh, Dedekind writes composition of forms out of the theory altogether and gives an account of it in terms of modules in a ring of quadratic integers. And Weber, his lifelong chum, uh, gives an ideal theoretic account as well. And composition of forms disappears from the subject at this point. Um, so here's another thought we might have. Does it rem is it deep just because it's really hard? Right? And would it cease to be deep? Does it cease to be deep? Now that you can learn it from Dedekind, from Weber, from Hecker, all these people. Um, and here's a Hermann Weyl comment uh, from one of his essays. Um, the problem's been solved by brute force, first of all. And then he says, only then come the axiomatizers and conclude that instead of straining to break in the door and bloodying one's hands, one should have first constructed a magic key of such and such shape. And then the door would have opened up quietly as if by itself. But they can only construct the key because a successful breakthrough enables them to study the lock, <laughs> lock front and back from the outside and from the inside. Okay? Uh, and one has a lot of sympathy, I think, for this remark. Uh, so I think if we're talking about depth, st I still sort of feel we need to know whether the result is obtainable easily in some way um, by just grafting on or, or finding down the line that we have some theory that makes it all straightforward. So for example, we have group theory. Gauss didn't, but we do. Um, can we say that this is just uh, group theory applied to number theory in a routine uh, sort of way? Um, I don't think so. But we should, if we're wondering about depth, I suppose, wonder about this particular thing. At all events, the answer here is no. Okay, This bit, this thing we've been looking at, of which this table's an example, is the point at which everything changes in number theory. It is the truly original bit. Okay? Up to this point, the proofs of the theorems are actually pretty elementary. They're pretty much congruence arguments. Okay? They're not, I don't think anybody would say they were deep even if Gauss was the first person to prove this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. Um, even the fixed relationship, you begin to suspect um, by just doing numerical examples. They fit to the way that Lagrange or Legendre would have been thinking about this. I can imagine Le either of those guys having done the table for quadratic forms of that discriminant if they'd wanted to. It's easy to find the quadratic forms of that uh, discriminant, uh, of a given discriminant. Um, I can imagine them sp perhaps sus sus spotting the pattern, spotting the three columns on the left and organizing it that way. It's explaining it that is completely different. And this is where the plus one comes in. You have to insist that your transformations from one quadratic form to another, the things that generate the equivalence classes in the end, are of determinant plus one if you want forms to form a group. If you don't say plus one, if you allow plus or minus ones, you don't get a group. And uh, in David Cox's book, um, which is, I think, called Quadratic Forms of the Form X Squared Plus NY Squared, it's a very catchy title, should be available in every bookstore, uh, has a very nice example of one of Legendre's class, uh, collection of quadratic forms. And it's a, just a nice exercise to work through and do the multiplication. And you wind up having to choose a square root. So sometimes the composite of this form and that form, and Legendre nearly has composite, is either this or that, guys. It's one of the two. It could be either. Well, there's no hope if you wanted to find composition for a group. If you have that the transformations have to be of the terminant plus one, that choice disappears. And that this tiny, tiny point is crucial to getting composition of forms. Uh, plus, it's not just group theory, it's group representation theory. In a little way, we have here his characters are really through common morphisms. Uh, you have the Legendre symbol in some sense. Uh, it's a multiplicative symbol. Um, deep, deep, deep into this, this group, it's not just that it's a group. This thing has a structure. The principal genus, the ones along the top where all the answers were yes, they are squares. Right? This is an extraordinary thing to say, and you can't say it without being able to compose forms, okay, unless you wait for Dedekind.
So what was deep in all of this? There's a group structure that allows you to capture the pattern. Your 16 equivalent forms form a group. There's a multiplication in this group with an identity element, which is the principal class 1, 0, minus one, zero 161. Uh, all of these things have inverses. The multiplication is associative. That's 30 pages of solid work. Okay. Um, you also have enough to prove quadratic reciprocity and to prove that half of the forms don't occur. And that you can't do without composition of forms or something like it. And the way the whole thing works, then, is that with the help of many other theorems, um, the uh, quadratic reciprocity is given a, its first really conceptual proof, and you have um, the, this theorem that half the assignable characters occur and half of them don't. The proofs are not at all near to hand, and nobody who reads a Discussiones finds it easy. Right? It's one thing to imagine doing a difficult piece of work. You've also got the opinion of people of the quality of Kummer coming along afterwards and saying, look, this is really hard. Right? Some things are really hard to do, but they're not so hard to follow afterwards. This is hard to follow afterwards. Okay? The proofs do not lie near at hand. They still don't. The, you, Gauss makes an excursion into ternary forms. Um, the Dirichlet argument uses the class number formula. The concepts are hidden. And, and this is crucial. When the uh, result is obtained, it has an organizational character. It drives the theory afterwards. It's not just an amazing fact. You don't just go, wow, somehow the theory is shaped by, or should be shaped by. This is the, the roots growing out into other bits of the subject. Okay? Um, it can be that the proof, more generally, the proofs are deep, or that the role the result plays is deep. Uh, it should, I think, if we're talking about depth, remain deep, even if we have a privileged access, a later access, to making some of these conclusions um, uh, easier to deal with. Um, I mentioned this already, so just to say it again, um, composition of forms goes, actually. We don't need to sweat through all of this. Uh, you can, and this is one of Dedekind's big aims, was to get rid of... Um, composition of form. So if you look at that particular supplement, the 11th supplement, he says one of the things he wants to do is to uh, use uh, the theory of quadratic integers to get rid of um, this composition of forms. And he actually writes this supplement twice. And in the first version, it's a bit of this and a bit of that and backwards and forwards. And the second time he writes it, it's a very nice story about what, this, it, what the theory looks like in composition language, what it looks like in module language, and a nice proof of uh, homomorphism between the two. So I leap forward now past numerous German number theorists to Hilbert Zahlbericht, because the Zahlbericht is usually taken as the write-up of number theory at the end of the 19th century that presents it in the form you can learn uh, for the uh, 20th. Um, and he presents it as a marriage of Gauss's ideas and Galois' ideas. Okay. Um, not to say that Gauss's ideas are exhausted, but that somehow they've met up with Galois. And I, I wanted to add just a little interjection here, and I have a slide for this one. Um, what Galois does actually is not contribute to the story of solvability by radicals. What he does is to say, this is not really a very interesting thing to do. Here's the story of solvability by radicals, and it's a story that says, don't think polynomials, think groups. And, they, and people just refuse to get it. Right? Galois theory doesn't get published until 1846. It doesn't get understood into Camille Jordan, 1870 or 69. Right? And for some time after that, it doesn't get understood. Okay? It is not an immediate acceptance. People don't go, wow. Right? What they do is they go, oh, you've changed the subject. Right? And it takes them some time to accept that the subject has been changed. Okay? Um, away from finding formulae for solving equations to talking about the groups. And when you teach this <laughs> subject, in, uh, unless you really want to do something slightly off-beam, 
When you get to the stage where you say to students, well, there you know, look, we, we want to solve polynomial equations by radicals. So what you do is you think that this polynomial equation uh, has a group which permutes its roots and blah, 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 blah. Do not at this point let them say, how do you find the group? Please just don't do this. We can do this apparently if you have a, the right computer program, I think for polynomials of degree up to 22, whose coefficients aren't too big, otherwise the program is just too long. It's a theorem of Dedekind that tells you how to find the Galois group of a given equation over the radicals, uh, over the rationals. Otherwise, just go with the flow. Change the subject the way everybody does. That's one reason why Galois theory is so important. It's a metaphor for saying, you have a problem in this bit of mathematics, we can transplant enough of it over here and do the business over here. Okay, so the whole algebraic topology metaphor right, derives in some sense from, uh, from Galois theory as a metaphor for, let's change the subject, keep enough of it to be able to solve our questions over here, okay? Just a, just a sort of digression, because I think if we're talking about something being deep uh, and we're talking about Galois, I would have to insist on the very slow acceptance of it. Um, anyway, back to the plan talk. Um, uh, Gauss's work is mentioned as being deep for various reasons. The uh, introduction of the Gaussian integers is regarded as uh, profound, for example. Um, Kummer, places both Dirichlet and Jacobi for their deep mathematical ideas. Dirichlet for seeking and finding several deeply hidden properties of numbers. Um, the uh, topic that, one of the topics that John brought in uh, is praised by Koma uh, for as being epoch making. Introducing analytical methods into number theory is like introducing uh, analysis into geometry. And it gives a deeper insight into apparently quite heterogeneous facts different things are going to start turning out to be the same underneath, okay? Um, I don't see Riemann using the word, even about Gauss. I didn't find Dedekind uh, use the word. Um, he says, Dedekind, about Riemann's work on the hypotheses, that the foundations of geometry, that that's profound. There's a little curiosity here about the use of the word deep. You're going to see um, people will use it about others, right? Weierstrass will, in private, talk about it. He'll write to Schwartz or someone like that and say he's preparing for a deep study. Otherwise, what people say um, is always about other people's work. You never say, I've discovered something deep, right? I've done a deep piece of work. You say he did, right? And or he's in this century, I'm sorry to say. So Fuchs and Koenigsberger, uh, struck by the deep content of Weierstrass's lecture course. Uh, Enneper is struck by Arbel's depth uh, in his work on elliptic functions. Koeniger, Koenigsberger is struck by Jacobi's depth. Uh, Runger says that Riemann surpasses Weierstrass in depth, richness, and fertility of ideas. Uh, um, Poincaré doesn't use the word much, but he does remark of Weierstrass. This is life's work had been to deepen the general theory of functions of one and several variables, okay? Whereas we had, I think Bob was talking about things that are not deep. Klein speculates that Weierstrass's listeners, the poor benighted souls, lacked a deep sense of what he was saying. Casarati worried entirely correctly that deeper research might be being choked off in England by formalism. Um, Brill and Nerta complained that Cauchy could have done better, uh, could have had deeper insights. Uh, Weierstrass was of the opinion that the French <coughs> lacked depth, but made up for it with clarity and elegance. Um, and Emit spoke of lacking the strength and courage to make a deep study of Weierstrass's new ideas uh, about prime functions. Weierstrass writing to other people will talk about deep research, deep immersion, uh, year-long reflections and deep research might be wasted. Um, on the other hand, Hilbert doesn't use this word very much if we're talking about deep. I, I was disappointed. I thought deep would be kind of leaping off the page of the Saalbericht because it's an ideological work, okay? Not only is everything marching under the banner of uh, Gauss and Galois, uh, but it's a very kind of Göttingen-focused work and many number theorists will tell you that the Kummer Kronecker treatment at the end isn't as good somehow. He could have done a better job and people came along later and did a better job, whereas nobody thinks Hilbert did anything other than an excellent job on the Dedekind side of things. Um, so Hilbert mentions Riemann's profound paper 
on the zeta function. He talks about some things, periodic and automorphic functions, um, being at the very deepest level, Comor and Kronecker, or he's out of sympathy with the way they work in some sense. So I think it's a little bit of kind of ideology here. He wants to say it's really deep, right? But he doesn't apparently anything in number theory just get around to it. This is the only time I can find that he used the word deep. A particular theorem gives rise to a new deep property. Now, I don't understand the theorem, and I'm not going to try and teach it, so skip down to the bottom. The term ramification ideal and prime factors of relative discriminant, never mind, thus have the same meaning. The ramifications ideals are the lth powers of the ambig prime ideals. Ambig is a technical term in this subject. Okay? So two things have the same meaning. A hidden connection is being brought out, and that is what the deep property is. The only use I know of it in Saalbericht. Um, but he did write a preface to an American number theory book of 1910 by Reed, um, a rather jolly piece of advertising, um, in which he praises the theory of numbers. Um, he actually, in a bit I haven't quoted here, talks about number theory works, and number theory really lasts. He says they're like classic paintings. So, you know, things come and go in mathematics, but number theory uh, really. Um, Last, we extol it as the pattern for the other sciences, as the deepest, the inexhaustible source of all mathematical knowledge, prodigal of incitements to investigation in other departments of mathematics, such as algebra, the theory of functions, analysis, and geometry. Okay. So again, this idea that um, it brings things together and it generates new ideas. Okay. Okay, the French allegedly weren't deep. I agree. And I don't think they minded. Right? And this is the story about their reception of Cantor, largely. Uh, and it's driven by Hermite. So I have to tell you about Hermite, a uh, passionate admirer of Gauss, so closely connected um, with German mathematicians, Kronecker, Weierstrass, Fuchs, and the like, um, that after the Franco-Prussian War, some French mathematicians accused him of being disloyal. This is a man of the Catholic right. Okay? But he was accused of being disloyal because he had mathematical friends on the other side of the Rhine. Um, a major number theorist in the analytical tradition, okay? Um, this didn't get Cantor's work, really seriously didn't get it. Mittag Leffler is going around promoting it. He's used it in his own big theorem, um, and he thinks other people might like it. And he tries to persuade Hermite that Cantor's work should be translated into French. And here Hermite replies that Monsieur Poincaré judges that almost all French readers will have absolutely no inclination for the simultaneously philosophical and mathematical research of Mr. Cantor, where the arbitrary plays too great a part. And I do not think he is mistaken. So Mittag Leffler pushes back and says, I've used it. I think you're going to use it. Um, and um, he says, Poincaré particularly, he's always been encouraging Poincaré, Mittag Leffler, will draw considerable advantages from it, I think. But you know, we'll see. And Hermit replies, the impression that Mr. Cantor's papers produce us is pitiful. Reading them seems to us to be a real chore. None of us is tempted to follow him. Among the results that can be understood, it is impossible to pick a single one having any actual interest. <laughs> the correspondence between the points of a line and a service leaves us absolutely indifferent. And we think that this remark depends on such arbitrary considerations that the author would have done better keeping it for himself <laughs> and waiting until something will be deduced from it. OK. Um, Picard joins in, apparently. <laughs> never stopped cursing the author, um, <laughs> and explains to Mittag Leffler that in the beginning, Cantor's speculation seemed uninteresting to me, except from the philosophical point of view, which means, you know, when you've got nothing better to do. Um, but hey, I'm just quoting. Um, finally, they changed their mind. Poincaré and Picard, I know it's April Fool's Day, but nonetheless, proposed Cantor for membership of the Société Mathématique de France, uh, where he is indeed elected. Okay, so they begin to get it. What's at stake here is the top-down, bottom-up story. Emit pushes, you've got problems. You really want to solve those problems. Throw yourself into those problems. You may use amazing ideas to solve them, but you want to solve that problem. And you want to s also, you know, you should really appreciate the details. You should savor the delicacies and the subtleties of these things. They're speaking to us, right? It's actually not Poincaré's view. Poincaré doesn't think that. Um, that's what I mean. So this German view that you should set out really what are the right ways to think, what are the proper governing ideas, and from that derive your theorems, strikes the French at this time as, as really rather odd and artificial. I mean, if, unless it gets to a real problem, why are you doing it? Okay, what, what is the payoff here for all of this you know, clever, clever work? 
And they seldom use the word. Uh, even Poincaré, who's very different from Hermite and doesn't savor the details and gives you the overview and much prefers giving you the overview, doesn't often speak about deep or profound. And when he did, he's talking about Weierstrass. Uh, and the few occasions I could find where they use the word deep are flattery. Fred Holm is writing to Poincaré because he wants Poincaré to put one of Fred Holm's papers in one of the French journals. So uh, it's your deep research that has inspired me. Um, our Cauchy, who just failed to get any of Laurent's work published, this is Laurent, the Laurent theorem and complex function theory, sat on it, refused to get it published. Laurent has died. Uh, and Cauchy says, oh, it was, it was a deep piece of work. All right. Um, so I thought, since we were invited to speculate, this is the next bit of the talk, last bit of the talk, since we were invited to speculate uh, on what Deep mentioned, I did what every Brit does, and you reach for the Oxford English Dictionary, um, <laughs> which offers a bunch of interesting remarks, hard to fathom or get to the bottom of, penetrating far into a subject, profound. The, the poor dictionary's got a problem here. It's going to tell you that Deep is profound, and profound is Deep. How can you avoid it? It has to lie below the surface. It's not superficial. Um, actions that are deep or processes, <laughs> the mind has to be profoundly absorbed or occupied. Uh, deep conditions, states or qualities would be perhaps intense, profound again, very great in measure or degree, of actions profoundly affecting mighty or influential. So I think this you can take these over to mathematical things. This, the theorem is going to be deep if uh, it's going to involve a lot of thought to get. That's the kind of thing Weierstrass is saying. Uh, and it should be powerfully affecting. The th for a theorem to be deep, it should have implications, either the results or the methods or something. And we were talking about this earlier on in the, day, in the morning. Deep applied, I think, to methods might be deep, uh, might be different from deep applied to the result itself, right? Uh, profound. Uh, not that different, actually far below the surface, demanding deep study of a field of knowledge, containing depths of meaning and import, uh, showing insight. Uh, we were talking at lunch about deep insight, I think uh, Alistair there was. Um, how about the other words we were invited to think about? Fruitful, surprising, all of these, some of which came out in Bob's talk as well. Um, I think it has to be difficult. I think what Gauss is saying, there's that feeling that you don't get the result easily. If it comes to him easily, I don't think he would have called it deep necessarily. So the, the result has to be hard to find. Um, it has to be hidden, um, inaccessible, mysterious, unlikely to be surprising. Okay? Um, I think that's my sense of what Gauss is on about. It would therefore be. Um, and you might have a horrible proof, by the way. So when we're talking about deep theorems being proved, um, the claim that the proof has to have some other extra qualities is, is not one that Gauss would necessarily endorse. And one might go looking for better proofs as a result. It seems to me that the things that Gauss are on about, that it's hidden, that it's difficult to find, that it has an organizational power when you get it, mean that it's going to be fruitful, that it's going to be fundamental, that it's going to be explanatory. I uh, had a very helpful conversation over lunch. Explanatory to the kind of people who can understand that sort of explanation, right? Which isn't necessarily what you would put in front of beginners, perhaps. I think Gauss is very concerned about putting things in front of beginners. Um, it's important because it organizes. I really want to insist on this. I think Gauss particularly is talking about results being deep because they organize the subject, maybe by p connecting to other sub seemingly to other subjects, pulling things in. Um, all of these other things, except fundamental, it seemed to me, could happen and not be deep. Right? I'm not sure I quite stand by that now, having listened to Jamie's talk. But I think apart from fundamental, you could, an idea could be elegant or it could be fruitful without actually being deep in the sense that Gauss means. Um, I'm really not sure how to distinguish deep from, from fundamental. Um, the only thing I could come up with is this list here, odd, even, right, left, commutative, non-commutative, compact, non-compact. They're very easy distinctions to make, but we are inclined to say they correspond to something pretty deep here. right? Um, some of them, e it's easy to see. The theory of commutative and non-commutative groups is going to be very different. Uh, we had an example earlier on of uh, the way in which compact is a really important thing. And if your space isn't compact, you've got a different kind of work to do. 
Um, or an even and right and left, although everybody says these are tremendously fundamental. Um, I'm stuck, actually, for a really kind of satisfying example of, 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 of why they are. They're the two things that Hermann Weyl says are the most, uh, strike him as the most fundamental things uh, when you're thinking about mathematics. Um, we also say something is a deep and mysterious fact. We haven't much talked about deep facts. Um, but it's a deep and mysterious fact that in the such and such theorem, all the numbers that come out are integers. They could have all been rational. Turns out they're all integers. This is a deep fact about um, some theory or other. Um, deep results, we do try and want to make them natural. We try and want to make them easy. And this is what Dedekind did uh, with composition of forms. He made it seem uh, much more straightforward. So this is my conclusion, at least um, as I would try and summarize Gauss. A deep property in mathematics is one that is or has been hidden and has significant organizational power. It shapes, guides, and explains a large body of ideas. And on that note, I'll end. Thank you very much. So let's, uh, as with this morning, do the same sort of move transition here that we have a little bit more time just for questions. I was just going to ask, the quote, the quote you gave from Gauss about um, getting a, 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 a lucky combination. Right. Um, that, actually, I remember that quote, and it tweaked something in me, and I looked it up, and, and um, uh, it, it confirmed something I was thinking. One other thing that you might take out to believe about that is that it should be, uh, or at least certain case, uh, in media, this is a, a, can be a, a sufficient contribution or a contribution is that it brings things from, from disparate right. uh, subjects, right? Different, different yes. and, and here's how he continues that quote. Uh, he says, this significant phenomenon arises from the wonderful concatenation of different teachings of this branch of mathematics. And, and from this, it often happens that many theorems whose proof was, for years was sought in vain or liber later proved in many uh, different ways. Um, and then he sort of continues the point about Find it by induction, fine, but then you have to go to um, uh, Then, uh, but after such good fortune, one must not, in higher arithmetic, consider the investigation closed or view the search for other proofs as a superfluous luxury. For sometimes one does not at first come upon the most beautiful and simplest proof, and then it is just the insight into I mean, the wonderful concatenation of truth in the higher arithmetic that is the truth attraction for a study and often leads to new discovery mm. of the proof. Uh, and then he sort of repeats it. So here he also seems to be talking about, well, you, you have these, this concatenation of things that you're bringing together, and that in itself is a reason. Yes. For one thing. Yeah, I, yes, that's all I can say. Sure. Uh, let me see. Um, oh, no, 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 I couldn't have done that. Can I, I, I didn't want to scroll through the page. Oh, I can go there. We'll try 26 then. Uh, uh, well, not that one. <laughs> uh, I did have a longer paper, but I didn't want to bring that. Um, and now, wait a minute. Kay, okay, if you can read that, that's fine. What do I do to get the whole screen? on this? Because I'm not a Mac user. Control L on a... No, no, not. <laughs> That's the Australian version for John. Uh, I can solve this. Just give me a moment. <laughs> okay. Right. Presentation. No, no, presentation. Pre the second one. Oh, okay. I was instructed. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> you better have the number right, Jeremy. We just wasted everybody's time. Oh, I meant 20, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a liquidation to use for extracting these conditions for what counts as is, is it mm -hmm. whatever for, for Gauss. Um, and it's kind of a really great. And there's one thing you mentioned here, which did show up in your list, and that said the, the, the theorem has to be extremely simple. The idea is that the actual statements of the theorem have to be not a yes. math. Yes, that's a good point. Um, and 
emphasize that, and I wonder why you didn't emphasize that. Once I found out that Ms. Wilson got what seemed right, I think the goal of Kennedy was really not the horrible thing that takes five minutes to just explain what it means. It's supposed to be something else. But even that, you see, that's, that's always puzzled me about the finite <laughs> simple group classification, right? You know, this, the claim these guys make that our proof is the longest because there's 10,000 pages and we still haven't finished. And I sort of wonder, where do you start counting, right? So a simple theorem, all of the technical terms in which are complicated, and let's say not too many of them, yeah. that's not necessarily simple. Right? I mean, in any sense, at the very least, you have to unpack the technical terms and say what we're talking about here. But yes, I guess Gauss does say this. But it's, but it's, it, the, 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 it says it's quite clear. It, they're so profound. Uh, that, that part of making it most beautiful, the simplicity, together with the profundity, is what's making it beautiful. I don't think it's just the simplicity. No, but I, th I, th I think Jeremy's right that you, Gauss would not accept a, as, a, as a, a deep result or something which was terribly complicated to state. I think that's, I somehow have the sense of the way, the way Gauss w worked and other things I've looked at, that that is not something he likes to do. Obviously what's being said here is that, look, these results are really easy to state. He can point to at some stage that they're really easy to discover. It's the fact that the proofs are so hard. And that, a point I didn't make, and I will, I will use your question as an opportunity to put back. I think one of the things we're talking about here is a very structural view of mathematics, and that's why I went on about the Germans rather than the French. If you've got a problem-oriented view of mathematics, and you really just want to solve these problems, right, which is, a, I don't have any quarrel with that view, don't get me wrong, then you're going to throw everything you've got at it, right, and you're intelligent and informed and educated and skillful, and I don't mean you just throw anything, but you do really try. Um, if you've got a structural view of mathematics, then you're more in the language of there are right proofs and the right way of thinking about this. And, the, and I think what you see with Gauss is, is the origins of that, and that's what grows up in Germany, right? Is that there's more to doing mathematics than solving the outstanding problems in mathematics. That somehow the organization and presentation of a systematic theory. And you start getting this attention to uh, the right kind of proofs and then the next generation along. Galois, of course, is the same. Um, is this idea that, sure, come approve this result and it takes pages and pages and pages and it just turns up at the end. Or you can think about what's going on with these, in this case it's the p functions, this differential equations. And if you think about it, in about a page you get the same results. And isn't that much better? Because you're not going to be able to work the way that Jacobi did. Jacobi has equations, some of them are are two pages long. We're just going to have to admit that we have a better way of organizing mathematics or the subject will grind to a halt. That's a German view. So I think what you have here is a feeling that there is a, concept, a hidden organization to mathematics which is more conceptual than had been appreciated before, right? In which there are certain I was going to say, well, p virtues like simplicity, but they're partly forced on you by the nature of the task, right? Otherwise, you just don't have a result. And they're going to be hidden. We're just going to have to admit it. We're past the era in which your results will come out by more calculations. This is an ideological claim. It's not true of all mathematics then or now. But it was the kind of... It, it's true in part. It's true of some bits of mathematics, and it's true here. Right, so that's what he's uh, pushing for, is the conceptual nature of this. That's what Riemann gets, absolutely gets. It's what Dedekind absolutely gets. Right? It's what Hilbert gets, and he doesn't understand why Kummer and Kronecker are doing something slightly different, or even more than slightly different in the case of Kronecker. Um, I don't know if you want to talk. Well, I think you know, most mathematicians could identify themselves and other people 
So, so two quick things. If you ever get the chance, you should try and listen to Don Zegia on birds and frogs. He's a frog. And he talks about, uh, he worked with Dick Gross on the particular theorem. And they'd meet every two weeks, and apparently Dick Gross would say, well, it goes like this, and give some wonderful grand answer. And, and Don would take a couple of weeks to come back with an argument which would, could, could have been done by Euler. All right? And they just went backwards and forwards with you know, dirty hands mathematics versus grand ideas. Um, and if you look, the other point is if you look at one of uh, Tim Gower's blogs, I think, certainly available as a paper, he tries to persuade you that combinatorial mathematics is just as good, just as deep as. And his arguments for what are just as good as these really hard Bourbaki type theorems are the, the ways in which certain combinatorial arguments come up. You know, this one's in stripes and this one's in spots, but it's the same argument. And it, I'm a historian, I'm out of my depth. It doesn't feel convincing to me, I must say. Um, so I think there are these takes on, on mathematics anyway, right? Um, and the Fermat-Lasse theorem, when, when, when Wiles did that work, the gossip I got was, well, thank goodness this huge machinery proves something, right? <laughs> that we had this one, you know, marvelous, marvelous, incredibly difficult theory, and finally it was beginning to join the dots. And we were getting theorems out. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, I don't know. It's one. What, the, the random collection of people I know by first name, <laughs> but it's a random selection. But that was certainly a view. Do I want to say Barry Mazer wrote it down once? I don't know. I perhaps I shouldn't. Um, that these strands of mathematics exist is indisputed, I think. You're pointing to it from one direction and me from another. So I want to ask about hiddenness because this is a feature you single out, or one of the features you single out. And I'll, and I'll be thinking about it tomorrow. And I wanted to ask what you thought about the problem that hiddenness is maybe relative to the way that, or the abilities that we have to see. So if something is hidden, or that I live in a time period in which yeah. certain ways of thinking. And all those are a kind of relativity and a therefore subjectivity that I'm not sure we want. I wonder if you have something to talk about. Well, I'm, I'm lost at this point. You know, I am a historian. I don't have such a problem with saying all of these things are contingent. Okay. I don't have a problem, you know. We can do a pretty good job of teaching the calculus to people who don't have a huge, greater understanding of it than Newton, right? It was terrific when he did it. It was amazing when he did it. And now we get by quite well teach, you know, mass teaching it, actually. Um, can I imagine if we don't blow ourselves off the planet um, one way or another in a thousand years' time, people finding that Salbarich, the kind of thing that their 11-year-old should read, really? Yeah. Um, would it still be deep then? And it wouldn't be deep then. Something else would be. Okay. I, but then, I like, you know, Bob pointed at something about, and he said, look, nature says these things, and that's, I guess, I take a metaphorical take on that. There might be something. I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I don't have a problem if the answer turns out to be all contingent, but I'm open to the idea that there might be something which is at least this organizational thing, that at least we would say these ideas, I don't know if I want to say, I mean, I'm to, look, why would we want to have a concept of depth, which we could imagine taking forward 30,000 years, introducing to the Zorgians, right? We could have a concept of depth which wasn't quite so historically specific as this, right? Which nonetheless had this, idea that something is hidden, which after all, depth is, right? I mean, if you want to, the word in general use has that connotation. If we're going to take that word and apply it to something in philosophy of mathematics, maybe you should respect this idea that things that are deep are hidden, right? And, and say, well, you know, these, it's not just that they're organizational. Somehow or other, you dig down and you, things turn up that are unexpected, these these unexpected concatenations. Um, maybe that is just 
part of it, right? Now, if our take on it now is that yes, this is deep, but we would like to think in 200 years time it would look straightforward for a variety of reasons. Someone has a new way of thinking about it. We just get a bit more in tune with what's going on. Still, you know, there might, I'm, I'm confused. There might be a way in which we could say these things just are important when we find them. We know to go hunting for them. Um, I think these, I'm more and more aware of the history that some of the, up to a point, these people are talking to each other for the same reason that Roger Federer doesn't ask me to play tennis with him, right? That it, you have to be at a certain level to get it, okay? Now, is that just historically contingent or do we want to say actually no? It's better, and if so, why? Why would you, I mean, I could turn it around. What, why would you want to take things out of the historical <coughs> context in which they're operating. You might want to take them away from the subjective feeling. Ooh, wow, that's beautiful, because that's, you know, the traditional philosopher's view is to squash it with a newspaper in which was written in large letters, psychologism. Um, <laughs> but why you would take it away from the entire intellectual context in which it operates before you can identify it, I, I'm not sure. No, I, I think that's true. But I think when they, when they say, look, this is a deep result, they, the first thing I always thought they meant when they said that to me was, you're not going to think of the proof of this for yourself immediately. I'm going to tell you this theorem, and I don't expect your eyes to roll sideways and you to tell me, oh, I prove it this way. Right? That, those are the scary people that you do want to hire. Um, <laughs> I think I would insist on the organizational nature of this. But when they're saying deep, I think they are. I mean, no, you're not going to think of it immediately for yourself. So one of the smart mathematicians I know regards a th defines a theorem as a result you wouldn't think of for yourself. Being smart, he hasn't got very many theorems um, <laughs> to learn, right? But I think that's useful. It's better than 90 theorems in a lecture course. Students don't remember that. <laughs> 